Hello, I'm Dr. Mary Meehan. As a Catholic university, Seton Hall University is committed to supporting educational achievement within our community. That's why we're proud to support the important educational programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Protecting our elders from abuse, next on Caucus New Jersey. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community. Seton Hall University, where leaders learn. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The Northward Center. The Russell Berry Foundation. And by MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey. Promotional support provided by NJ.com. Small news, big news, true Jersey. And AM 970, The Answer. Welcome to Caucus. I'm Steve Adubato. You know, the National Institute on Aging says that each year, countless adults over, over the age of 60 are abused, neglected, or financially victimized. Joining me here in the studio to discuss the signs of elder abuse and ways to prevent it, we are joined by Carol Silver Elliott, President and CEO of Jewish Home Family. Amrit Walia, who is New Jersey Regional Managing Director, Wells Fargo Private Bank. Sharon Rivenson Mark, elder law attorney in private practice. And finally, Dr. Mark Pass, a geriatrician at Hackensack. Meridian Health, I want to thank you all for joining us in this very important discussion. Um, Dr. Pass, let me ask you, the term elder abuse, not a lot of people have heard of it. What does it mean? It usually means one of three things. Either someone has been neglected uh, by someone who's caring for them, someone's been physically abused uh, by someone who's caring for them, or someone's neglecting themselves, not taking care of themselves when they should. And, and I, I'm curious about this, uh, Carol, how prevalent, we're going to get into some of the financial issues in sure. a minute. But how prevalent is what we're talking about? The estimates that we have read indicate <clears throat> that between three and a half and five million older adults are victims of abuse in this country alone every year. It is a huge problem. Who's doing the victimizing, the abusing? So there are lots of answers to that question, but we happen to run an elder abuse shelter and we are linked to the other shelters around the country. And what we see is most often it is a family member. Often it's an adult child or an adult grandchild who's moved back into the home and is abusing their loved one, if you will, physically, um, verbally, sexually, and always financially. Now your type of, or I should say your type of organization, but a shelter like yours, how many do we have in the nation? There's 16. In the entire country? In the entire country. Because? You know, I think part of it is because there's no real funding for elder abuse shelters. We provide an elder abuse shelter within the walls of our long-term care facility because our commitment is to care for older adults. That's who we are, that's what we do, that's what we believe in. So we provide people with a stay of 90 to 120 days at no charge. We provide them with all the medical mm. and nursing services at no charge. It's not easy to get people to understand that this is not a big deal for an organization that already cares for older adults. You know, we have mm. a room. The core of shelter is a bed. I have a room. I have the staff. <coughs> I have the food. We can care for these people. Our goal is to get people into shelter in what we call for a crisis stabilization stay right. and then discharge them to the least restrictive and safest alternative. I mean, let me ask you this. There are some family members who watch us on a regular basis. Um, uh, who older family members who said to me, I can't believe uh, it happened three or four times in our family that they think someone, quote, stole their identity but it had to do with their credit card, their ATM, whatever it is. When we talk about financial abuse, yeah. what are we talking about? You know, this is, um, this is a huge problem that we face, not only in New Jersey but across the country. Um, from a perspective of population, uh, every day, 10,000 baby boomers turn 65. Mm. Right. So when you think about um, the number of people that are moving into this space that we call our elder generation, it's a massive group or What's volume. The, I mean, I, I, when someone says there's there are charges on my credit card, mm -hmm. and I don't know. And again, it could happen to anyone. But I, I've noticed that I don't know if it, I don't know what the statistics are here, and I don't want to be irresponsible because it's public broadcasting, and we don't engage in fake facts. 
But here's the thing. I, my instincts tell me that it, it is sometimes older people that have these charges. They don't know where it came from. How does that happen? And does sure. it happen more to older people? I think it does. You know, the reality yeah. is that our elder uh, generation, they, they are prime targets for criminals that are looking to take advantage of them financially, to take their identities and so Why on and so forth. Targets? Because they've reached um, an age where um, typically they've accumulated more wealth. Um, they, they normally have some kind of a regular stream of income, whether it be Social Security or a pension. Um, they, they oftentimes have issues with health. Right, um, cognitive um, limitations, right. handicaps, other issues that perhaps um, limit their social um, interactions, um, oftentimes their ability to communicate or, or reason through some things, and so they become more vulnerable. Um, when, when their um, identities are accessed or their information is taken, um, of course that puts them at risk. That, that's something that any one of us could face regardless of our age, but this generation of individuals is more susceptible. When you bring up um, topics of the fact that you know family members are oftentimes, or people that are close to them are oftentimes um, abusers, that is indeed true. Um, on the financial side as well? On the financial mm -hmm. side as well, unfortunately. Right. And, and the, there's the embarrassment factor of, right. of reporting um, a family member or anyone, the, the shame of this Sharon. having happened to you uh, and they don't want to come forward or they're afraid to come forward because they're dependent on the person who's actually exploiting oh, hold them. Hold on, wait a minute. Now, now, <laughs> so it's not just shame and embarrassment that I quote, someone could think, it, I could have let this happen, but it could happen to anyone. Right. But also... That's, it's more than shame, isn't it, that the person who, is, who has done this to them is has, someone they're afraid of. Right. Has control Could over be. them, <laughs> control over their existence, control over their care, control over their residence, control over their finances. So um, you're, you're, you don't know where to turn and how to turn on this person, in effect, because they're threatening you. And what are the legal aspects um, of this legal well, there, recourse? There's several things that can be done. Some of them are proactive. Uh, we always encourage people to do powers of attorney. What is uh, power of attorney? So, by the way, there's going to be a whole wage of websites up there. Check it out to get more information as we do this program. Well, what does power of attorney give you? Well, you des when you have the ability and capacity, you can designate someone to take care of your financial affairs, um, either when you sign a document or what's called springing when, when you become disabled, um, and a backup person, a successor agent, to someone who you trust. Um, that's one way to deal with it. Separately, uh, a medical directive um, and healthcare proxy uh, to deal with medical decisions. Yeah, but real quick, before I come back to, to Dr. Pass, <coughs> what about if the person you've picked to do these things is potentially the person and that who is victimizing and, and, you. And that happens. So we, we recommend a couple of things because yeah. you're right. You're right on on point. You know, in addition to um, powers of attorney for both financial and and healthcare, mm. we we uh, also advise that you know people make sure that their wills are up to date, not something that you put together in your 30s and now you're in your 70s and all of a sudden things aren't necessarily appropriate anymore. Um, a living will is important. A living um, will is important. Very very much so. Ir uh, irrevocable trusts. You'll want to make sure that you um, have a team. And depending on the individual and their personal needs, that team may differ. But you, you usually want to have not only a trusted family member or friend, but also perhaps a financial professional, financial a right. legal professional, and possibly you need someone a team, a team, need a team to help you and to, right. to make sure that your wishes, not only your financial situation and your personal situation, are protected, but that your wishes are carried out when you no longer can do it yourself. Let's try this. And, and by the way, Dr. Pass and I know each other in a different part of our lives. Uh, I teach in a physician leadership academy that you've participated in. And so I know the kind of leader, physician leader you are. I'm curious about this. Mark, physical abuse. What are the physical signs that you and your colleagues in your field see um, in older folks who are being abused from a physical point of view? So uh, physical signs to look for <clears throat> certainly are dehydration or wounds. Um, I think people who work with seniors know that it's very common to get skin tears. These, about 85% of them happen on your, your arms or your legs. But when we see tears in other places, on the breast, the abdomen, in the groin or the thighs, this is a, a telltale sign. Also, seniors tend to break bones. You've probably heard of people who broke hips. 
um, or bones in their spine, but not usually long bones, and certainly not spiral fractures where someone has twisted an arm or twisted well, a leg. Well, what do you mean? It confused me there. What's that? Uh, the kind of fractures that we usually see when people break hips uh, is a bone just breaking in half. But a spiral fracture means that the bone was twisted. Think about a rope burn. And that's a sign that someone physically was abusing that person. And someone didn't somebody... fall and that happened. Correct. The, again, a break is this, a different kind of... A spiral fracture means someone was twisting it with two arms. But, 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 but doctor, what do you say to those who say, well, if I'm alone, if someone's older, someone's in a hospital situation or someone's in a facility, wherever they are, they're alone. And a medical professional, someone there, a clinician, someone on the staff, whomever, is treating that person. How does he or she, the, the patient, protect him or herself? So uh, anyone can make a phone call when, when they think someone is being abused or neglected. And in a facility, that would be to the ombudsman. And if someone doesn't live in a facility, that would be to adult protective services. But the person who makes that call could be the mail carrier. It could be the bank teller. You know, the bank teller can pick up that someone has been coming in always dressed nicely, and now all of a sudden they're always accompanied by someone, uh, a younger person, <clears throat> and they don't have their makeup on or they come in their house coat. A change in someone's appearance is a telltale sign. So it's not just healthcare practitioners that can pick up on this. It's anyone who has routine uh, time spent face-to-face -face with uh, these seniors. Mm -hmm. And those seniors are... Honestly, they're women over the age of 80. They're, yeah. they're not... Women over the age of 80, yeah, those, prime target. Yeah, <laughs> if they've had a hip fracture, a stroke, senile, women over 80, you know, if you have all five, those are the prime targets. Those are the people we have to look for. Okay, let me jump back in here. Emotional abuse looks mm -hmm. like what? I can tell you about cases that we've had in our shelter recently. We have had, we have had a woman whose daughter was constantly screaming at her and belittling her and the, and the woman was afraid of her to the point where she left the home. She didn't know where to go, she had nothing, but she left the home because she was so fearful. The woman being abused? The woman being abused. We have had, the stories are really quite awful. And in terms of you know, what happens often with an older adult is they seek medical attention, not in a geriatrician's office, but in an emergency room perhaps, and the abuser goes with them. And so oh, wow. before they can answer the question of what happened to them, the abuser says, oh, she's so clumsy, right? Well, you know, she's we, we so spot clumsy. that in, in, yeah. in the bank as well, right? Yes. Well, because, you, you know, you see, you'll, you'll um, note that we, we train our, our team um, on an annual basis. It's, it's, it's a requirement to be able to understand what it looks like um, that is elder abuse. So if we see um, unusual financial transactions, significant uh, amounts of money being written out in checks or wire transfers, um, you know, people that aren't normally making financial decisions calling on behalf of, of one of our clients and, and asking um, for money to be transferred into different accounts, that kind of thing, they'll walk into a branch with um, the elderly client and, um, you know, maybe be pinching them from behind mm -hmm. or um, you pick kind that of, up. your team is trying, I'm sorry they're, for they're trained to, yeah, they're, they're trained, trained to pick, pick it up. up those signs. And not only do we, and do what? well, number one, you report it to the appropriate agency, but we're also working with regulators today to see if there are things that we can do from a banking industry perspective to take action immediately, right? To maybe not have that check or that wire transfer sent yeah. out because once the, the money's gone, it's very difficult to recover. Yeah, do me a favor, Sean, hold your part right there. Can I do this? Yeah. I'm going to take a quick break. We come back. I want to pick up this conversation that we're having right now. Uh, this is elder abuse, folks, and you're not going to find many places having this discussion, but I cannot think of a more important pressing issue for us to be talking about. Be right back right after this. To see more Caucus New Jersey with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're talking elder abuse, critically important topic. Sharon, jump back in. You were going to say? Um, the problem that we have with these financial tr transactions particularly um, is uh, not enough. Are they stopped before the funds are gone, uh, even though you witness some of these mm -hmm. behavioral issues. And when we're dealing with the seniors uh, on the legal side, 
Um, usually it's involving uh, long-term care placement at that yeah. point. Um, and we run into a very severe problem of how is the long-term care going to be paid for because Medicaid is going to be the last resort. The money at that point is gone. Um, it, it's been stolen. And Medicaid is very difficult um, uh, in granting approval when you cannot account for how the funds have been dispersed. Right. If it's a family member, uh, the initial position may very well be that it was gifted or allowed to be taken with consent, and Medicaid has a penalty uh, that will be imposed on, el uh, on the eligibility. So we really have to get into uh, telling people you have to prosecute in order to document that this was not a consensual do transaction. Yeah. No, most do not. do not. You know, it's interesting. Uh, one of our relatives. The guardianships. One of our relatives who, who has passed, just an incredible woman in our family, a matriarch in our family. I remember um, several years ago, word was spreading around the family that um, $10,000 had been done. I was like, what do you mean $10,000? And someone. I, I believe, the, as the story went, someone was calling, 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 and somehow told her that the, they were from either the, not the IRS, but someone else. I don't want to screw this up. Help me on this, because it's not really you know, about our relative. A, it could happen a lot all of over. fraud and she, that happens And she with sent the money. Adults, yeah. Don't ask me how. Um, oh, yeah. And no one else knew in the family. And then after the fact, it was like, you what? And I could see she, it was, she was embarrassed. It's like, you know, it could happen. That's exactly what I said before. <clears throat> It can happen yeah. any day, right? That's so right. you mentioned um, possibly the IRS. We had a, a couple coming. But it's not coming. the IRS. It's not. No. Well, the no, IRS it's not. Does not it's, cool but they're, you. But they're um, fearful enough that they will just write the check or give or their financial somewhere. information over the phone. I have yes, your we financial had information. That's what happened. Elderly yes. couple come into our offices uh, about a year back. Um, they were in their mm -hmm. mid 70s, and they were very excited and wanted to finally talk to a financial advisor because they were expecting to come into money. They had received an email Good and then a follow up phone call lottery, right? that there was. Um, an excavation being done in the Middle East that they were going to uncover antiquities and they needed funding for this excavation. Wow. And this couple went into the retirement monies and liquidated over $80,000 of funds yeah. and sent it. 80. 80. And uh, then they expected to, you know, come into all of this money as these antiquities were unearthed. And of course, it was a tragic. It? They did. They yeah. lost it. The telltale sign yes, it was for tragic. caregivers, um, doctors, nurses is when people were able to take care of themselves and afford their own care, and now all of a sudden they can't. So they come to my office month after month, and then all of a sudden they say they can't afford their medicine anymore. Mm -hmm. Or I notice that they are not changing their clothes and they, they right. can't afford mm -hmm. cleaning service anymore. Or they used to have an aid with them, and now they can't afford an yeah. aid. What do you ask? Where did the money go? Yeah. I ask them three questions, the same three questions that any of us yeah. um, can ask them. I ask them in private, yeah. not in front That's of the That's interesting. Service. No one it's else in the key. room. No one yeah, else in the room. Three key. questions. This is what the AMA recommends, the American Medical Association. Do you feel safe in your current home? It's an open-ended question, and I listen for their response. Right? I don't just ask and then move on. Or the lack of response. And you um, exactly. Yeah. Who? Who helps you plan your meals? It's a, another open-ended question. Someone can really give you a lot of information when they tell you who helps them plan their meals. Uh, and the third one is, who helps you with your checkbook? Mm -hmm. But what does that exactly. have to do with potential abuse? Because <clears throat> when they're alone, people admit to much more than when they're sitting That's next right. to their wow. supposed abuser. trusted they're caregiver, right. power of attorney. Especially right. if they're the abuser and they're yeah. afraid. Right. Yeah, but, the, but, 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 but 90% of the people who are doing the abuse are adult children of the abuser. 90? 90. Is this right, Carol? That's absolutely true. I'm not true. questioning your They isolate the victim, yeah. like in any other form of domestic violence, they right. isolate the victim. So that isolate. victim's... That their life gets smaller and, smaller and smaller right. and smaller, and they get more and more control, and that's exactly what happens. You, They're controlling right. every aspect of the victim's life to a point where the victim really has nothing beyond that. And you know, you talked about embarrassment before. Think about it. This is my child. I taught them values. How do I go forward and say I'm afraid right. of my child? Ask yourself I mean, the question: When you're 80 and above and you've broken a hip or had a stroke, who are you going to trust the most? The kids. Yes. Well, and well, that's well, the problem. Okay, but also, we trust our kids the most, statistic. and they're the ones who take advantage of us. That's Something right. we haven't talked about. One in five people over the age of 65 are impacted by elder abuse. And one in five. 
of those those cases actually get reported. That's right. Say it again. I, I, I stepped on that. Say it again. One in five people over the age of 65 are impacted by elderly abuse, and only 2% of those crimes are actually reported. Can we, there's mm -hmm. something we haven't because talked about that I'm curious about. Um, neglect. Mm -hmm. Is neglect, A, what is it, and B, is it a form of uh, elder abuse? Well, there are two kinds. There's neglect by a, uh, another party, right. and there's also self-neglect self mm. when someone uh, deteriorates and no longer has the capacity to take care well, of Well, how does that abuse? That no one's helping that person? Um, yeah, they're basically alone. Uh, protective I mean, isolated services. Isolated again. Right. Adult protective services can respond to self neglect cases as well. Uh, we're focusing I mean, that's, on. That's the majority of what they respond mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. the, the sad thing is that most of the cases that are reported to APS. Our self APS is adult protective adult. services. Okay, that's who's responsible for community dwelling people. Oh, in our is that is that done on a county level? County, every state, yes, county has every state, agency. every county. Oh, has like, county. Are, are, is there uniformity in the way no. they operate? No. What do you no. mean no? What, uh, hold on, they, uh, they don't not run operates. with the same standards. As every county they is don't. different. Some counties are more proactive than yes. others. Um, they're all um, underfunded, understaffed, overworked, uh, but they don't operate the same. But the majority of cases that get presented to APS yeah. are self-neglect, self meaning it's a, it is a bank teller. It is uh, a next-door neighbor who says, Sally hasn't been out of her house in a week, but I see her moving around inside. Someone picks it up. Something's the different. The postal carrier says the mail's we worry about We worry about each other and self-neglect, and that's what we report. But the truth is, people are being physically abused. Yes, they're they being are. mentally abused. They're being financially sexually abused, abused and financially abused. And those are not reported nearly as much. Right. Because when you, when you see a grandchild going into a pocketbook of a woman in a nursing home, and you work in that nursing home, you're afraid, if you report it, you may lose your job. So even though the people who work in a nursing home may work there 40 or 50 hours a week, they're not the ones doing the reporting. But this, you know, this can happen to people um, that live independently. This can happen to you know, any wealth yes. echelon. I, I can tell you a story about a client who is in what I would deem as the ultra high net worth wealth contingent, right? She was a phenomenally successful and well-known financial professional. She's now in her late 80s. Um, out of nowhere, um, one of her former financial advisors, not part of Wells, um, uh, who's, who's about 30 years younger, um, decided to become her fiance. Um, she is in the early stages of Alzheimer's. So all of a sudden, this tremendous amount of wealth um, is now being controlled and um, influenced by this new fiance. How does that happen legally? Well, her, her niece, who um, is the, the sole um, you know, beneficiary and, and heir, reported it to the family attorney and said, I think my aunt's at risk. Is this a legal case now? It is a legal case, and, and we're doing everything we can to protect so, the So client. stay on this. By the way, we would not be able to be doing these programs if we're not for the Health Care Foundation of New Jersey, who cares deeply about these issues. So I, I, you know, and the reason I say that is because it strikes me that this doesn't feel, Carol, like while it may be a bordering on an epidemic or an epidemic itself, it does not feel like a public crisis where there's tremendous discussion about it. Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. And, you know, we do a lot of speaking and education about elder abuse prevention. And one of the things we say universally is that we need to raise the level of conversation about elder abuse to the level of conversation about child abuse. You take your child to the pediatrician and oh, something wow. looks funny and they say, you know, mom, step out of the room for a minute, let me ask, you know, little Johnny what happened to them. But our older adults universally do not have that opportunity and it happens over and over and over again. They don't have the ability to self-identify, they don't always look for help, they don't know where to go, they're embarrassed. They're controlled. They may have some dementia. They're in an incredibly difficult situation. And even when they're identified, we had a woman who was identified at the beauty parlor. The only place she went was to get her hair done on Friday afternoon. And the beautician noticed that she was wincing every time that she moved. She finally got out of this woman that someone had knocked her down and tossed her down the stairs. What did the beautician do? She called Adult Protective Services. They How did called she not us. do that? Because we train everybody we can think of to train but people, who, bank tellers, beauticians, physicians, police officers, first responders of all kinds, attorneys. I, we mm. speak to attorneys all the time. Call the police. Call the police. Call nine one one. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Final final words here. Yes. If you see something, say something. Amen. That's what we're trying to get out. Amen. Of. It's quite simple. Hopefully, we're going to make some real progress here. 
necessary? We can. The whole idea of people being embarrassed, ashamed, I get it, I understand it, but the more we talk about it, the more we put it out there, the more people like yourselves appear um, on a platform like this and help so many people, I am hopeful, prayerful, that we will make a difference. So I want to thank all of you uh, for doing a great thank public service. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. We're very happy to be here. I'm Steve Adubato. We'll see you next time. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, Seton Hall University, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Northward Center, the Russell Berry Foundation, and by MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. How do you create change? By cultivating hope. And we see that every day. In the eyes of our preschoolers, in the souls of the seniors in our adult day program, in the minds of the students at Robert Treat Academy, a national blue ribbon school of excellence, in the passion of children in our youth leadership development program, in our commitment to connections at the Center for Autism, and in the heart of our community, the North Ward Center, creating opportunities for equity, education, and growth.